Welcome to Whiskey Lore, the interviews. I'm your host, Drew Hanish, the Amazon bestselling author of Whiskey Lore's Travel Guide to Experiencing Irish Whiskey and Whiskey Lore's Travel Guide to Experiencing Kentucky Bourbon. And today we are heading to Scotland to dig into the history and whiskeys of the Tomatin Distillery. I can say it. <laughs> uh, Whiskey Lore Stories fans will remember the distillery from the ghost dog Kubakin in season one of the podcast. And I've had the honor of traveling around the village there and touring the distillery. And today you're going to get to learn more about it with my guest, Tomatin's global brand ambassador, Scott Adamson. Scott, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me, Drew. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. This is great. I, I love the view over your shoulder. For those watching on YouTube, they will get to see that, that beautiful house back there. Uh, tell me, who got to live in that, that beautiful facility? Yeah, so my lighting's not great, but it does mean you get a fantastic view behind me of the house <laughs> and then even behind that, the Monoliath Mountains. So that is one of the original distillery cottages from 1897. There was three of them built. This is the one in the middle. And for most of its history, it was occupied by the tax officer. So in Scotland, right up until we had the internet and we could have all of the casks registered online, um, there would be a HMRC officer on site at every distillery and that was the house that was pri provided for that officer by law I think the law came in in 1823 that distilleries with a license had to provide accommodation for a tax officer and you know you travel around the highlands of Scotland and the houses that they were given were absolutely stunning um, more recently that was occupied by our former master distiller a gentleman called Dougie Campbell he worked with us here for 53 years, and mm. towards the end of his career, that was his house here. Very nice. Yeah, that's uh, the, some of the things that I miss about traveling around the distilleries in Scotland. They're seeing the old Spirit Safe, which, of course, was his his domain. Nobody got to touch that without yeah. uh, him being around. And um, uh, the Porteous Mills, which you have one of those. That's right, yeah. Well, we, we have two of them. We use one of them. The other one is now... Uh, been moved downstairs so it can be part of the tour uh, but part of the history of Tomatin was it was such a big distillery that we almost had double of everything um, and the Porteous wow. Mill being one of them yeah it's a fascinating history and to walk around the place you you get a sense that there was a much larger business going on there at at one time uh, and so we'll jump into the history a little bit and talk about that uh, and Let's start off with the area first, because you and I were chatting before we started recording about history and lore and the idea of distilling. Distilling has gone on for a long time in that area. The distillery's start date is 1897. But, um, but talk a little bit about that region and probably what was going on there before Tomatin existed. Yeah, absolutely. So Tomatin, you know, for, the easiest way to describe its location today is 15 miles south of Inverness. If you're in Inverness, you get yourself onto the, the A9 road and you drive for 15 minutes and you'll be at the distillery. But if you take a step back and look at the map of the Scotch whisky making regions, Tomatin actually lies at the very heart of the Highland whisky making region. It's halfway between John O'Groats in the north and Stirling in the south and halfway between Aberdeen in the east and Kyle of Loch Elsh on the west. It is right in the middle of that region. Um, and, you know, the whiskey making in the Highlands, it's, it's difficult to summarise because it is the largest whiskey making region in Scotland uh, by, by geography. Um, and there's so many different styles of Highland whisky, even within our distillery. Within our core range, we're going to have different expressions and different flavours. So summing up what the region does is very difficult. But historically, when we talk about whisky making in the Highlands prior to 1823, we're, with the exception of Ferintosh, we're talking about illicit whisky production. You know, we're talking about um, the, the, what's been left at the end of the farming year, what barley's left being turned into whisky. It was part of the household. Um, in, in many, many instances, we, we hear these stories of um, whiskey making being part of the, the daily chores. You know, it's, it's part of, you know, you're making bread, you're milking the cows, you're making the whiskey. It was part of the story. Um, and when I first came to Tomatin, the story here, uh, so where we are, 
we're, as I say, 15 miles south of um, Inverness, but we're 315 metres above sea level, one of the highest distilleries in Scotland. And in fact, when the distillery was built in 1897, it was the first distillery in the Highlands built inland. Every other distillery in the Highlands is coastal because you needed boats to get your ingredients to the distillery, you needed boats to get your whiskey to the market. But we were built in the same year that the Highland Railway line was completed. So that gave mm-hmm. us a different form of transport. But anyway, that, that makes us one of those kind of classic areas for illicit production because it was just simply difficult to get to. You know, it's 315 metres above sea level. It's on the eastern edge of this monolith mountain range. Um, and the story uh, that I heard when I started at the distillery was whiskey has been made in this region since the 15th century and <laughs> cattle drovers from Inverness would fill up their, their, their horns with spirit on their way to the market. And it's a lovely romantic story. Um, I couldn't find a shred of evidence to back it up, mm-hmm. but it's, it's still a great story. But what we did find, actually, is the oldest building on site here at the distillery. It's called the Old Laird's House. And uh, it's up on the hill just behind me right here, just behind the house there, up on the hill, there's this Old Laird's House. And up until 1897, it was the only building here. Um, It was built, the first record of it is around about 1711. Mm. And there is a record um, in the days and weeks after the Battle of Culloden of a copper pot still being found in the house. Uh, the, the person that occupied the house was called Gillis McBain. He was uh, part of one of the local clans. He fought at Culloden, later died of his wounds. Um, and following the battle, the, the government forces, they kind of um, went through a process of knocking on the door of every Jacobite and every Jacobite sympathiser to really outrule this rebellion and, and totally quash it. And when they got to Gillis McBain's house, they found this copper pot still, which was worth seven pounds of silver at the time. So it would have been producing a decent amount of spirit. And the story goes that he was selling that spirit to the King's Inn at the bottom of the road. So he was selling it to the people that he was hiding <laughs> it from. Um, and there's something in the name of Tomatin as well. So Tomatin in Gaelic means hill of the juniper. So the word Tom means hill. So if you think of Tam the Vulin, Tam Du, Tom and Tool, it's all hill in the same way that Glen is valley. But that Aten part is juniper. And we all know juniper to be the main botanical used in gin. But the tree, the, 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 the bush that the berry grows on, when you light that on fire, it creates an incredibly intense heat, but no visible smoke. So it was hmm. the ideal fuel source for illicit distillers. So... That, that's the name of the region. That's not the name that the, the distillery came up with in 1897 and said, you shall be called Tomatin, you know. Yeah. So there's, there's stories of illicit production up and down the Glen. The, the real interesting part of illicit distillation is that you only have a record when people got caught. You know, if, <laughs> if, if you were doing illicit distillation well, there shouldn't be a record. So yeah. um, in, in some ways, we're lucky to have the record of the house here on site. In other ways... Um, it, it, it's a sign of failure, ultimately. <laughs> it's the the subterfuge is what I find fascinating. When I was in Campbelltown and I learned about the the guy who was distilling in his basement and he had hooked it up to the chimney so that the smoke was going out of the chimney. Nobody knew <laughs> that what he was doing, yeah. but he was distilling whiskey in his basement. And you're right. I mean, this is the challenge that we have in terms of trying to document history. You can't really document what you don't know. And if they're doing illicit distilling, they don't want you to know. Yeah. <laughs> so, And, and, and it's, it's almost like the, the, the criminal will always see the, 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 the law as the enemy and they will be doing everything they can to, when they find of a new technique, they'll be finding a new way to hide it and things like that. So it would have been a constant uh, cycle of, people getting caught, finding a way around it. You know, you hear stories of stills being found in old churches and things like that because th- there's no way they would be distilling in a church. Well, th- they absolutely were, you know. it's yeah. And, and that's, what, that's what makes it fascinating. It's, it's part of, I think that is part of the real romanticism of Scotch whiskey's history. Um, and I think sometimes it gets blown out of proportion. I think everyone wants to lay claim to a history of distillation before the distillery was built, um, which... You know, if you've got it, fantastic. But if you've not, tell the story of the foundation of the distillery and why it was built there, you know. 
Yeah, exactly. Well, and there could be some issues with that as well if your distillery started in the 1800s because nobody was really documenting that much. They didn't know that future historians would care. They were just making whiskey and making money to survive. They weren't necessarily trying to do this for posterity, whereas today we look at it from a marketing standpoint and say, hey, you know, uh, here is our posterity <laughs> laid out for you. Um, and so they sometimes you have to sort of clutch at straws and see what you can what you can get to be able to fill that that story in. Yeah. I think I think what's fun about driving around that area is that there you you get a sense of this isolation of of the area so you kind of get that impression while you're there but then you have the big um bridge by the uh by the motorway yeah. that where the train is going through and that tells a story too of when the trains finally came through that that was really your opportunity to have these kinds of distilleries and make that connection between Inverness and Glasgow and, and Edinburgh. Yeah, that's true. I mean, what I find fascinating about this, and I only found out recently, so just to the south of Tomatin, over the River Fintorn is the Tomatin Viaduct. And, you know, you go further afield and you have things like the Glenfinnan Viaduct, which you see from Harry Potter, this incredible uh, piece of Victorian uh, engineering and industrialization. And they're absolutely beautiful things to look at today, and you see people taking photos. What I love is going back and looking at the the public commentary at the time, and people talking about how these these viaducts were a scar on the landscape, <laughs> and they were making the beautiful <laughs> highlands horrible. And what yeah. it, it, it bears a striking resemblance to today when we install um, the wind farms. You know, uh, up in the hill behind me, there's a huge amount of wind farms going in now. I think they're quite nice to look at, but a lot of people go, this is ruining the Highland scenery. So that commentary has been going on for a hundred years, but you're right. You know, for us, um, without the railway line, there would have been no Tomatin. Um, and what's really interesting is that we know from um, archives that our founder was involved in the conversations around the route of the railway, around the final route. Now, unfortunately, we don't yet know what that conversation looked like and how much influence he had over it. But we do know that he was the factor of the local estate. And so, you know, where, where the viaduct goes, there probably would have been an easier way to build the railway. It might have taken longer, it would have taken further. Um, but th this was a, a feat of engineering that took over a decade to build. People died mm. building this viaduct. and um, But what it did was... Up until that point in time, the railway only went as far as Aviemore, and then you had to take a real big circular route to get to Inverness. But by building uh, the Fintorn Viaduct and then the Culloden Viaduct, um, the Inverness to Aviemore route was made much, much shorter, and it, made, it essentially connected Inverness to the rest of Scotland and from there to the world. So... This is at the time where we've got the kind of Victorian boom, not just in whiskey that we talk about, but the romanticisation of the Highlands. You know, you've got the, the Sir Walter Scott movement, you've got Queen Victoria up at Balmoral, you have people travelling to the Highlands to see this rugged beauty and to go hunting and fishing um, and connecting Inverness, which even today is the capital of the Highlands. That brought a huge amount of people to the area. Um, but as we know from Speyside as well, the railway line gave whiskey in this region a lifeblood because up until that point in time, and I, th I think that's, you know, it's part of our, our founder's story is he had spent his life dedicated to benefiting the community. And we can go into that a little bit. Um, but he, it was only with the railway line that he was able to bring modern industry to the region. Um, because up until that point, if you wanted to build a distillery in the Highlands, you had to be beside the water. That was the only mm -hmm. way to get your casks to the market and to get um, to get your ingredients to the distillery. That's the reason why Campbelltown became such a huge distilling area with uh, or almost 30 distilleries at one point. And now we look at Speyside and we go, geez, if that was, to, if that was part of the Highlands, the Highlands would be even more diverse because we're talking about 50-some-odd distilleries being added to that as well. 
So yeah, talk a little bit about uh, the influence. John McDougall is the man you're talking about, right? The founder. That's right. Yeah. So John McDougall, uh, he, he's a fascinating man. And we actually, through things like his obituary and things like that, we know a, a huge amount about the guy. So he was born in Tomatin, which he was born in Tomatin in 1833. And at that time, you wouldn't have even been able to call Tomatin a village. It was a, a scattered population at best. It was shepherds. It was estate workers. Uh, but he was the son of the parish schoolmaster. And so from a very young age, he had this kind of incredible work ethic and a commitment to the community. So by the age of 17, he'd set up a business as a merchant. Um, he'd opened McDougall stores, um, which was still the name of the village shop until maybe 20, 30 years ago. Mm. And uh, from there, he became the merchant, very successful. His obituary it states it's a, a business unlike any in the Highlands at the time. Um, and from there, he was a busy guy. You know, he became the postmaster, the registrar. He became the justice of the peace in Invernessshire. He became the chairman of the local school, school board himself. Um, but I think what's fascinating to the, that kind of um, development of the community is that he was the factor of the local estate. Mm. So the factor's role as part of the estate, particularly in the Victorian time, was uh, designing and implementing improvement schemes. So this could simply be ways of um, better farming the land. It could be ways of diversifying, so you know, bringing in sporting to the area. Um, and so that having the railway station in Tomatin was a massive benefit to the local estate from a hunting point of view. But it would have also have been developing ways to make more money out of the land that you had. And so in 1897, that led to him establishing the Tomatin Distillery. So he was able to get a plot of land from the estate. He was able to get access to the water source, access to the minerals, so for the peat uh, from the local estate. So this would have all have been part of building the local community. It would have been bringing new people. It would have been building the economy. Um, first and foremost, for the estate. You know, the, the estate would have been taking rents from, from the distillery. And so on the 8th of June 1897, the, the, the Tomatin Spade District Distillery Company Limited is established. I think the name's fascinating as well because um, by geography, by the definition of what the Highlands is, Tomatin is a Highland distillery. Mm -hmm. But at the time, Speyside was so heavily romanticised and, you know, you had the Glenlivet and things like that, that they wanted to have Spey in their title. Um, and so it was 1897 that the distillery was founded by John McDougall and um, through, through heavy investment from other people, um, both locally and further afield. So it was almost, there was a little bit of crowdfunding going on, if you want. It was an interesting time period too. A lot of distilleries that I research, it's amazing how many popped up there in the last decade of the 1800s. And of course the Patterson crash came along and pretty much collapsed the industry and the DCL was going around buying up all of these distilleries. I think that's what's amazing to me is that some of these distilleries just simply, even being somewhat new, Ben Romick comes to mind, uh, shut, shut down, but then start back up. So you guys were shut down fairly quickly after the the initial ownership. Did, did he continue to own it when it came back online or did he sell it off? So what happened was, so Tomatin, as you say, uh, in the 1890s, there was 33 new distilleries built in that decade alone, mm. which has a striking resemblance to what we see in Scotland right now, which is interesting. Um, you hope the, the, the crash that followed in the <laughs> 1900s doesn't follow uh, in the next decade. Uh, in, in 1897 alone, there was 11 new distilleries built. So the great thing about that was it was really easy to find people to build a distillery. You know, there was people with expertise in distillery building at the time. Um, and so Tomatin opened in 1897 and it closed in 1906. Um, now, it's hard to say that that was a direct result of the Patterson crash. From what I've been able to piece together through looking at the company's accounts from that time, it struggled from the get-go. It, it really mm. didn't. It, it wasn't one of these distilleries that opened in 1897 to huge applause and, and then was tragically lost. 
it really struggled to get going. And I think that is part of the fact that it opened right at the peak. Um, you know, it was from the moment it opened, whiskey was going downhill a little bit. Um, so John himself retired in 1903 and sold all of his shares at that point. Um, and unfortunately, he passed away in 1909. Mm. So he retires in 1903, sells all of his shares. He still lives in the village. He would have overseen uh, the closure of the distillery, which I, I would imagine that would have been quite a hard thing to, to bear witness to after all these years of trying to bring something to the community to, to see it go away in such a short period of time. Um, and then it was purchased in the same year that he died. It was purchased in 1909 by two families from London, uh, the Callinghams and the Saunders, who were wines and spirits merchants in their own right and were incredibly successful. So I think it's more, f from what I've seen up until 1906, it was a small distillery. It was really rudimentary. Um, it was only making whiskey to sell locally. Um, mm. I was, it, what was really interesting when I was researching the history of the distillery, I found, I managed to get in contact with the descendant of the distillery manager that took over in 1909. And he was able to tell me, you know, that a, a lot of work had to be done at the distillery because when they bought the distillery, the spirit that was being produced really wasn't of the, the character that these two families from London were looking for. Mm. And more recently, I found in our archive um, a document uh, written by Charles Doig, that kind of renowned distillery builder of the 1800s. And he came to Tomatin uh, when it closed in 1906. And he wrote a full account of all of the equipment that the distillery had and, wow. and, and gave recommendations for how to re-engineer the distillery. So when the distillery was purchased in 1909, they followed Charles Doig's plans and it kind of reinstated it to be a distillery of a much higher quality. And what these two families were doing was they, were, they weren't only using the, whis the whiskey for themselves. That's when they started to sell it to the kind of bigger blenders within Scotland at the mm. time. So it went from being a local kind of community distillery, Highland distillery, Highland whiskey for Highland folk, to being a supplier to the whisky industry at large through the tweaks that took place between 1906 and 1909. So in, in many ways, what happened when the distillery was closed is arguably more fascinating than when it was open. <laughs> I actually found, um, and I'll try and send it over to you as well, I found a photo that was taken at that time of the house that you see behind me with the roof caved in. You know, it had been totally abandoned wow. and the roof, roof had collapsed. So a lot of work had to be done in that time. That's really interesting. I wonder whether it collapsed or they actually knocked it in because the roof tax. The roof tax, yeah. Yes, may have caused them to say, because this is what kills me about going around Scotland. So many of those castles would probably still be in decent shape if it hadn't yeah. been for them knocking the roofs off of them to not have to pay tax. Yeah, I mean, I, I worked um, for White and Mackay for a year and they had Jura Distillery. And all of the old photos of the original Jura distillery are without the roof because of that very thing, the, the, the roof tax. So, um, you know, you, you wonder how many of those distilleries that were closed at that time just couldn't be reopened because of the fact that they were in such a state of disrepair. Yeah. Were there any stories that you found around World War One or World War Two with the distillery being used for something other than distilling? I had come across a story... Um, and, and this is one of those ones that I, I couldn't find any real evidence to support it. And I'm not entirely sure if it was during World War I or World War II. But one of the stories that I'd come across was that at one point in time, Tomatin was where Scotland's sugar ration was stored. Mm. Um, now, that would be an incredible thing. It would be a, a, a difficult place. I, I can't imagine why you would put it here. You know? <laughs> um, Did you have a train? So, but we, we've, got a, we've got a train, yeah. so uh, whether it was Scotland's, whether it was more local, um, so I, I, again, I don't know how much truth's in that, but from a whiskey making point of view, um, one thing that we do have is we have our, and again, I can send you a photo of this, one thing that I found, I want to say it was about 2015, I was in the attic of the visitor centre, I didn't realise the visitor centre had an attic, uh, mm -hmm. but our visitor centre, if you come to Tomatin, that was the distillery's head offices up until the 1970s, 1980s. 
and it's now been retrofitted into a visitor centre. And I was in the office one day, and there's this ladder coming down from the ceiling that I'd never looked at before. And I asked, you know, do you mind if I take a pop-up and have a look about? And most of what was in there was the old, you know, you know the guest books that you sign beside the door to say that you had a wonderful tour. It was yeah. a lot of that. It was a lot of old promotional material and things like that. But over in one corner was this incredibly big, thick, um, kind of skin-bound, brass-plated book. And on the end, it said, Tomatin Warehouse 1909. And it was the, the warehouse record book from when the new company, the new Tomatin Distillers Company, took over the distillery in 1909. And it records every cask of whiskey that was filled uh, between 1909 and 1929. Um, the cask type, who it was filled for. So that's where we start to wow. see a lot of these blenders names coming in. Yeah. Um, but there are some poignant things. And one of the most poignant things is the last cask filled and during the First World War. You know, that would have been the time that the distillery had to close, the boys had to go over and fight. And then a few years later, there's the first cask to be filled when they're able to start distilling whiskey again. I can't remember the dates off the top of my head, but I can certainly find them and, and let you know. Yeah. But it's there is something about that just that knowing what we know now seeing the record of that last cask being filled and then thinking god nobody knew what they were about to get into you know it's it's a, it's a horrifying thing yeah uh, but, but a fascinating little piece of whiskey history well that's the thing is that as i start digging through archives i'm going through the national archives here looking at the names of distillers in the 1870s and then all of a sudden I start seeing that th all of these distillers in 1870 are not distilling, they're disappearing. And I'm going, okay, this is telling me a story. I need to understand what it is about this. And um, I may never find out, but it's yeah. one of those things that as you're looking at it, we think of these ledger books as maybe, you know, just containing some dry information, but there's so many stories that they can tell us about the time period and and the thing you bring up is the idea of what kind of casks they were using back then. Were they, um, because here's the story that I've been trying to dig into. When truly was it that American bourbon casks started coming over? Was it because of what happened after Prohibition? Uh, or were there some American casks uh, trickling in prior to that? Well, I, I can confirm that there were casks coming in prior to that. So I need to go and check. I, I'm trying to remember. It's been a few years since I've really spent time with the book. But if I remember correctly, the first record of a bourbon barrel that we have is around about 1914. So that predates Prohibition by, the end of Prohibition by about 20 years, you know. Mm -hmm. um, I'll go and have a look at that because I think for, for the work that you're doing in the history of American whiskey, it's incredibly important. And when I first saw it, I thought, that doesn't make sense. That doesn't add up. You know, the story that we've been told is sherry all the way to 1933 and then bourbon ever since. <laughs> now, of course, you know, we're, we're getting throughout the 1910s, we're getting rum casks, brandy casks, porch, a lot of sherry, granted a lot of sherry. But then we do start seeing the occasional bourbon barrel. And the understanding that I have is that by that point in time, as much as it was far away, the industrialization that was going on in America made it much easier to make casks over there than it was in Spain. Uh, but also there was a change in the way that people drunk whiskey in Scotland um, or, or, or in the UK, I guess. So you go from the 1800s where it's the toddy um, and that kind of big sherry style would have done very well. And then you get... Um, I think it was called like whiskey and potash. It was essentially whiskey soda, whiskey highballs. Mm. Started being drunk in the, the 1910s, 1920s. And part of that is because bourbon casks come in and make it a slightly sweeter style. The question that I always go back to is chicken and egg. You know, did, did distillers start using this style of cask because that was how it was being drunk? Or, did that, or was that the way it was drunk because distillers had changed the type of casks being used? I will. I need to spend a bit of time on in in that book alone, and just there's a story of Tomatin from 1909 to 1929 that can be built up just by extracting the information from that book. But as I say, it's 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 yawn deep. It's it's a, it's a massive, massive tome. So um, yeah. So we need to have a look at it. 
this is the fun part about digging into all of this stuff is that history is always shorthanded and uh the the idea is let's take this in little chunks and send it out to people so that they can understand it and when you're on a tour and your tour guide is giving you the history of the distillery it would be very hard to go in and give all of the intricate details that lead up to saying something in a story and so we come up with these shorter answers but as that as they keep getting told the more we start thinking that's the way it is and that's the way it was and we start missing the fact that um you know bourbon really the steamship probably helped bring bourbon barrels over to europe more than anything because yeah. it was faster transportation they were probably still coming across the question was back then did they were they as concerned about the barrels that they were using or were they just trying to find a barrel <laughs> that they could put their spirit in exactly and i think that's the thing uh, today we associate casks so heavily with the quality of a whiskey um it's such a big part of the story uh, that that it's almost, you know, on every package you will see the cask type. If I look at tomato packaging from even maybe 15 years ago, there's not a mention of the cask. The story mm. is tomato tastes this way because of the wonderful water source that we have. Now, we know that's scientifically not to be the case anymore. It has an influence, but it's not as important as the cask type. Um, the casks, the, the reason that casks were used, the style of casks that were used right up until the 1980s and maybe even the 1990s is availability um, mm -hmm. and, and economy. Um, you know, it, it wouldn't even necessarily have been, um, you know, we can get these wonderful Spanish sherry casks. Well, okay, but what about if these bourbon casks are half the price? That, yeah. That's the way things were done, you know. Um, if we look at the casks that were filled in the 1970s, when by which point Tomatin was the biggest distillery in the world, it's all refill casks. And the reason you've got to think of this is that up until the 1990s, these whiskies were not being bottled as single malt. They were going into blends. Many of the casks that were being filled were being filled with the intention of being bottled at three, maybe five years old. There wasn't this, um, th th nobody had the foresight to be thinking, well, if we put it in this and then finish it in that, and then if we go and find a direct supply to a port cask, then that will add a, a huge amount of um, marketability. That wasn't what was considered. It was a case of we're making all this spirit. We need wood to put it in. Where can mm -hmm. we get it from? And that's why the industrialization of cooperages in America, as well as the the kind of bourbon being American whiskey being filled into a fresh charred oak cask, that became so important. Um, that also coincided with a downturn in the popularity of sherry. So with the downturn of the popularity of sherry, you've got less sherry casks coming over to the UK, but at the same time, these bourbon casks start to become more available. It's interesting to you note that Tomatin was the biggest distillery. Was it in the world or was it in Scotland? Yeah, so by the 1960s, it was the biggest malt whiskey distillery in the world, at which point it had 12 stills. Um, it then increased in 1974 to 23 stills, but wow. by that point, um, Hakushu in Japan was bigger. So it had been the biggest in the world, and even though it got bigger, it then became the biggest in Scotland, uh, the biggest malt whiskey distillery. This is interesting from a standpoint that you are upping the size of this. I saw a figure of 12.5 million liters. Does that sound uh, that's, like an, that's, an that's the number, yeah. Okay, so 12.5 million liters. I think about today, and I think about we're in a whiskey boom, and um, I think it is uh, Glenn Fittick and Glenn Livett that both are in are competing for who's leading, and I think they're in the 21 million yeah. liter category. So that shows you this was not a boom era. So it, it's interesting that Tibetan got that large and was producing that much spirit in a time when we were sort of entering a whiskey depression, uh, per se. Yeah, so, so what happened was, so, so I, I guess the, the, to take a step back, the Saunders and the Callinghams, they come in and they change the business model and they start selling spirit to blenders. So they're selling spirit on contract more than anything. They're going out and saying, 
how much spirit do you need from us this year? We'll make it, we'll, we'll mature it on site. And then you take it off site when you need it. And that was the way they built their business. Um, now in Scotch whiskey, you know, I'm sure there was a lot of interesting things happening on a day-to-day basis, but from the 1910s through to the 1940s, the story is dominated by war and prohibition. You know, there's mm-hmm. not a huge amount of development. But then coming out of the Second World War, Scotland, the UK, as as is, had an incredible debt to pay. And the government realised that whisky was going to be one of the ways they were going to pay off this war debt. Um, so a lot of the laws around how whisky was made changed going into the 1950s. So small things like um, up until the 1950s, you weren't allowed to produce whisky on a Sunday. They got mm. rid of that. Um, up until the 1950s, you were not allowed to brew and distill at the same time. So your your mashing and your uh, and fermentation had to take place one week and then your distillation the next week. They got rid of that. So by doing that alone, Scotland's capacity for whisky making doubled overnight just because now you were able to work simultaneously. So there's a huge demand for whisky. Um, you've got a booming market in the United States all of a sudden. You've got a booming market in Japan, again, driven by the the demand of american troops over in the uh, over in japan and then you've got an, an emerging market in europe and it's all for blended whiskey you know this is not a single malt boom the single malt story really begins in the 1990s and in all honesty from a volume point of view it takes off in the last 15 years maybe mm. when we're talking about the post-war boom we're talking about blended whiskey it's that madman era of of cutty sark and things like this you know um and Tamatin, because of its strong kind of basis that the the two families had built up prior to the Second World War, had this reputation as a great whisky for blenders. Um, by the 1970s, it was regarded, and the quote is, Scotland's most prolific supplier of malt whisky. Mm. Um, and so at that point, it's going into Johnny Walker, J&B, Cutty Sark. If you can name a brand of blended whisky, Tamatin was probably the backbone of it from a malt point of view. Um, so by 1974, we're producing 12.5 million litres of alcohol. The 1970s still was boom time. Um, okay. But what happened over the following decade blew people away. So if you came to Tomatin in 1974 and looked at these amazing 23 stills and said to the stillman, in 10 years, this distillery is going to be in liquidation, you would have been laughed out of the place. No one would have believed you. But that's what happened. Tomatin went from being the biggest, most efficient distiller of malt whiskey in the world. It was list- It was the first distillery listed on the stock exchange. Mm. Heineken owned shares in the distillery uh, in, in the 1970s to 1984 being bankrupt, being the first distillery since the Second World War to go into liquidation. And a few things happened. There's a global recession, first and foremost, you know, the, a c- catastrophic restre- recession globally. So the consumer's buying power for whiskey diminishes. But also we start to get to this generational thing where now people, uh, the people that had left the Second World War and enjoyed their whiskey, they're getting a little bit older and their sons and daughters don't want to drink what their fathers had drunk. So you get this white spirits revolution. You get the boom of vodka, particularly in the States. And in Japan, it was shochu. Uh, 1984, shochu becomes the biggest selling spirit in Japan uh, for the first time. That's when it overtakes whiskey. So economic downturn, change in tastes lead to what was called the Great Whiskey Law. Because back then, we were not in contact with the market we were in the way we are today. There was no visitor centres, there was no brand ambassadors, you know. Uh, we were selling spirit to another company who would mm. blend it and then sell it to the market. And they kept buying and kept buying and kept buying. And then all of a sudden, they couldn't sell anymore. And when they stopped selling they stopped buying from us. So we've gone from being this supplier to the industry to no longer having customers. And what was happening was companies like DCL, as it was at the time, which now went on to form Diageo, of course they were maintaining the supply from their own distilleries rather than the third party like us. So we were Mm. one of the first to go. We were one of the first victims of this crash that went right into the 1990s. And it wasn't until Aaron Distillery was built in 1995 that you start to see us coming back out of this dip as well. Um, but yeah, 1984 Tomatin for the second time goes into liquidation, but luckily it was once again saved from that. Yeah, so before we jump into the uh, the newer era, 
23 stills. That's an interesting number. Yeah. Because it, it tells me that maybe we're triple distilling something or uh, what could it be? It, it was it was really simply a case that we didn't have a balanced system. So um, we had 12 wash stills, which is your first distillation, and 11 spirit stills, which is your second distillation. Um, now, today, when we're producing whiskey, we, we have what we call a balanced system. So what that means is that we'll take in nine tons of barley and we'll mash that with 45,000 litres of water and that will give us our, our, our mash. Mm -hmm. That will fill one fermentation vessel, uh, which will give us 45,000 litres of wash, which will fill directly three wash stills. And once that's distilled and you add the four shots and faints from the previous distillation, that will directly fill two spirit stills. Mm. So today, although we have 12 stills, we only use 10. We use six wash and four spirit. So we're balanced the whole way through. Back in the 1970s, as soon as a spirit still was empty, it was filled again. We didn't have that balance system. It was really producing whiskey quite quickly. So it, it just worked out that the volumes meant that over the 12 wash stills, you only had the liquid to fill 11 spirit stills. So there was yeah. no triple distillation or anything like that. It was just a case of let's get this through the stills quickly. So the other thing that I think about is the fact in doing, because I've done a lot of research on Irish whiskey history, and what's interesting is there were several things that brought the Irish whiskey da uh, uh, industry down, prohibition being just one of many things. The other thing that really hurt them that I think Scotch didn't have to necessarily worry about was they were still shipping everything in barrels to blenders, and that ended up really tinkering with their quality and and kind of put it out of the hands of the distillers and didn't allow the distillers to manage their own um, quality brand, you know, per se. So it's interesting. It makes me hear you tell that story. And I think, will we learn the lesson that distilleries sort of need to hang on to their their identity in their whiskey and not let it all go out to other people to manage their reputation. Yeah, it's it's an interesting thing because if you look at our, our kind of inventory, we've got we've got both. You know, we've got spirit that's been made in the last fifteen years that was dis, that's been distilled here with the intention of being bottled as single malt. You know, and the way we've made whiskey. Uh, the way we make whiskey today is very different from the way we made it in the 1970s. The core kind of uh, characteristic is the same. It's a fruity, mellow, uh, quite a um, complex spirit. That's always been the case. But today it's of a consistently higher quality, partly by moving to that balanced system, but also just by focusing on the single malt so much more, you know. Today, for example, we have the longest fermentation in Scotland. It's a, it's a full week long fermentation, 168 mm. hours. Back in the 1970s, it was only fermenting for as long as it took for <laughs> that yeast to, to make alcohol, you know? Yeah. But the, the, the difficulty that we have is that some of the best whiskey that we have is from the 1970s. Because what's happened is it's been put into a refill cask, a, a cask of very little character but it's been left to oxidize for 45 years. So you've got this incredible production of esters and these wonderful tropical fruit flavors. So you look at those old, old whiskies of Tamatan and the 36 year old's a great example of that. It's just won uh, the, the, the best in show at the San Francisco World Spirits Competition. That's, that was not made in the way we make whiskey today. That was made at a time when everything we were producing was being sold to blenders um, and, and with the destination of being blended you know these these casks are survivors in many ways today we produce whiskey with the intention of it being bottled under the tomatin label what's really important though is that every single bottle of tomatin that you buy has been fully matured on site even if mm. you go back to our oldest casks um, a lot of the casks that we have from the 1970s are things that were sold to blenders um, but we've bought them back in the last 20 years, but they've fully been matured here on site. So part of the contract you had with Tomatin was, we will produce the spirit, we will fill it into casks, we will mature it here on site, 
and then when you're ready to bottle it, we'll ship the casks down to you. Uh-huh. The casks that we still have are the casks that at some point in time just they, they just stayed on someone's ledger and they were getting older and older and older. Eventually it gets to the point of, well, we can't put this into a three-year-old blend. Um, <laughs> let's see if the distillery want to buy it back. And, and that's, that's, so a lot of our old stock has been repatriated from other companies. So it's fascinating to go and see the filling sheets and the journey that that cask has been on through ownership and things like that. Were you surprised when you first started dipping in and tasting things that were meant for blending and saw the character that they produced? Yeah, I, th- I think that, that that's a great point. So um, this these old casks of whiskey, I remember the first time trying one and thinking, I didn't know that whiskey could do that. It was a totally different style of flavor. And um, I think that's um, one of the f- fantastic things about it is a lot of what we talk about today when it comes to maturation is this additive influence that the cask has, you know. So the, f- the compounds that are in the wood, whether that's from the oak itself or the previous content, being added into the whiskey. And they create wonderful whiskies. You know, a- a- an example I use here is our 14-year-old, which is matured in tawny port casks that have held port for uh, over 50 years. You mm. get this incredible influx of flavour from that old tawny port wine. When you look at these casks from the 1970s, that additive maturation is not happening because the wood was tired when the whiskey went, when the spirit went into the cask. It's this productive style. It's a different type of maturation. It's a style of flavour that can't be rushed. You know, mm. so when you speak to uh, distillers around the world and they say, uh, because of the temperature here, our maturation takes place three times as quickly as it does in Scotland. That is true for those additive interactions, but you cannot rush oxidation you cannot rush esterification it takes decades um, yeah. and it's why you know i think of tomatin from the 1970s and 1980s there's other distilleries that have great examples as well of just these really tired old casks that have been left for long enough and one of my colleagues uh, also called scott he, he'll quite often be tasting this whiskey uh, tasting and he'll say you know it's actually really easy to make incredible whiskey if you've just got an incredibly long period of time in a bad cask, you know, it's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's a different thing. Um, yeah. And, and I think, I think once you understand that there are two different beasts, yeah. that's when you start to really appreciate that not one, there's not one better than the other. It's ultimately what you prefer, but they're different styles altogether. Well, I think what is interesting about that whole subject is the fact that, when I see older ages on whiskeys, I sometimes avoid them. And the reason I avoid them is because, with American whiskey especially, boy, you know, in a new oak barrel, you're going to get some intense flavors the longer yeah. it's sitting in that barrel until it becomes just all wood. Right. And so that's the challenge to me. There are certain styles that I don't like seeing in a in a barrel for too long. Uh, peated whiskeys, rye whiskeys, because the longer they're in, it seems like the character that I really like in the whiskey is dis- disappearing. However, um, if you're putting it in a tired cask, then really you're getting a chance to let the new make still continue to shine through years later yeah. and not be overly influenced by that that oak and it and what it says is age statements really don't necessarily tell the whole story oh no they definitely don't they definitely don't and i think regardless of age when when it comes to tomato and single malt we're always looking for a balance of uh, maturation character absolutely but also distillery character because without the distillery character it could be any spirit you know it's mm-hmm. it, you know a Quite often when I try a tomato that's been fully matured in an Oloroso sherry cask, uh, which is a component of our 12-year-old, you know, that's one third of how we make our 12-year-old, that in and of itself is a big sherry bomb. And the reason I use the word bomb is because it obliterates the distillery character. Mm -hmm. We have to then add refill casks and bourbon barrels into that mix to give you something that has a sherried influence, but is still a quintessential tomato in single malt. Um, and that's where the whole age thing comes into play, as you say. So you could take a, um, a five-year-old whiskey in a virgin American oak cask or a 25-year-old whiskey in a refill cask and the five-year-old might have more cask influence than the 25-year-old. So mm-hmm. it, it, I think that 
it's not so much about age as it is maturity. And they are different things. I think that's important to remember. Yeah, getting to understand. I mean, there's a whole, such a science behind uh, all of that. And it's this is what makes it fun as a whiskey fan is learning all of this and understanding the, the different steps and how each one of them can create such a different variation in the resulting whiskey. So um, well, let's jump back to the the story and we go back to 1985 and very interesting because um it's it's a time period where uh as you say the some of the more clear spirits are are doing well uh you were purchased by a japanese company and the japanese have always been looked at as you know trying to emulate scotch and maybe take scotch to another level uh, or put their own spin on the whiskey. Um, was there a lot of Japanese uh, investment in the Scotch whiskey industry at the time, or were you guys really kind of the first? So Tomatin became the first Scottish distillery to be fully owned by the Japanese when it was purchased in 1986 by Takara Shutsu and Okura and Co. at the time. Today it's T uh, Takara Shutsu and Kukubu. Um, it was the first distillery to be owned by the Japanese then, but there had been Japanese money coming into Scotland for 15 years prior to that. So, again, like Scotland at the time, um, Japanese whiskey from 1923 when uh, Yamazaki was built right through to really the mid-1980s and even into the 1990s, when we're talking about Japanese whiskey, we're talking about blended whiskey. But the mm -hmm. rules there were very different and still are very different to the point that not all of that spirit was made in Japan. And the reason for that was in Scotland, we've got this incredible relationship with other distilleries where, you, where we will trade casks. You know, So I'll take a cask of tomato and we'll trade it with another distillery and then we're able to make a blend. Um, and it's a, it's a lot more complicated than that. But largely speaking, there's this relationship. Japanese producers never had that. Japanese producers um, would make their own spirit um, and our uh, parent company Takara Shutsu they had a brand of Japanese whiskey called King Whiskey it was mm -hmm. a blended Japanese whiskey and between um, 1951 and 1969 they actually made the malt whiskey themselves so they made the malt whiskey at a distillery called Shirakawa and we have actually just released the only ever single malt bottling of Shirakawa, which was distilled in 1958 and is an incredible wow. tale in its own right because this distillery only made malt whiskey for a 19-year period between 1951 and 1969. Um, and the reason they stopped is that in 1970, Takara Shutso started buying whiskey from Tomatin. Um, uh. But not just... They were buying it from Tomatin, but it wasn't just Tomatin that they were buying... They were buying tomato and single malt, but through us, they were also buying other malts that we had brought into the distillery. And by 1984, when tomato enters liquidation, Takara Shutso are our biggest customer in the world. And very simply, they decided that rather than losing the supply of whiskey, they would buy the distillery. Mm. Um, the, the ironic thing about that is that they were also, they are the reason that Shochu became the number one selling spirit in Japan. They developed a brand of shochu called Jun uh, throughout the 1970s. And they had adverts with David Bowie, with Sheena Easton, with John Travolta. Into the 1990s, Madonna was in it. And uh, so by 1985, Jun was the biggest selling spirit in Japan. They had, had this incredible shochu boom, but they had also bought tomato by this point in time. So yeah. they totally stopped making whiskey at Shirakawa, uh, which is why the parcel that we've got is this incredibly rare single malt from the 1950s. Um, but very simply, the reason that Tomatin was bought by the Japanese was rather than lose the supply of the whiskey, we will buy the distillery. And mm. so we kept producing whiskey and we kept selling it on to Japan. Um, what was brilliant about that is that Tomatin, even today, still works fully autonomously of Takara Shutsu. So our board of directors are based here at the distillery in Tamatin. Um, we're, as far as I'm aware, in terms of the big Highland distilleries, we're the only one with our headquarters still on site at the distillery. We're not based in Glasgow. We're not based in Edinburgh. We're certainly not based in Kyoto. Um, yeah. we, we work fully autonomously of them. And 
the way that I like to sum it up, and it's probably an oversimplification, is they didn't buy the distillery to change what we do. They bought the distillery because they liked what we do. Mm. And as long as we're uh, ticking the budget box every year and still making money, they're very, very happy. So what's happened in the time since then is that we've continued to supply whiskey to Japan throughout the 1990s. In the 1990s, so this is a part of the story that people don't really know. We talk about how big Tamatin was in the 1970s and then we talk about the catastrophe of the 1980s. But in the 1990s, we were responsible for 10% of all of the malt whisky made in Scotland. We were still a wow. big producer. We were still really important. It yeah. was just Scotland as a whole made a lot less whisky at that point in time. Um, throughout that decade, though, we realised that third parties were not going to be the way to continue the distillery. We were going to have to start developing some of our own brands. We'd, we'd been releasing Tomatin as a single malt since the 1920s, but in very mm -hmm. small volumes. We had a brand of whiskey, blended whiskey called Big Tea since the 1960s. But in the 1990s, we bought a brand called The Antiquary, uh, which one, was one of the biggest blends in the world at the time. That gave us our first kind of glimpse into cased goods rather than bulk spirit. And that's where we kind of took our learnings and from 2000s onward started to focus on the single malt and started to focus on the distillery's own brand. So since the Japanese have bought the distillery, the scale of production has come right down. So in 2001, um, 11 of the stills were removed. As I say, we've got 12, we use 10. This year we'll produce about two and a half million litres of alcohol. So it's a it's much smaller. It's 10 million litres less than we were yeah. capable of in the 1970s. But the focus has been, over the last 20 years, shifting towards our own brands and very much controlling our own destiny. And it goes back to the point you make about, you know, we now control where our spirit goes to. Uh, we now know where, where it's going. For a long time, you could find a lot of independent bottlings of tomatin because these were casks that were purchased by blenders um, they weren't used in blends and they were sold on to independent bottlers. Some of them are incredible, uh, but some of them not as good. And we just don't yeah. have the control over that. So today, you, it, it will be very rare that you find a tomato in independent bottling uh, compared to 10 years ago when I started working at the company. Did you find in the archives some of the old labels? And how yeah, far we back, did. And, we and did. how far back did you find? So we have a bottle that... From the information on the, the label and the information that we found on uh, archive, I believe it to be the original bottle from 1926. So the Callinghams that owned the distillery at that time, their business was called Henneke's, uh, Henneke's Wine Merchants. And there is a record from 1926 of a Henneke's bottling of a nine-year-old tomato. Mm. And we were able to purchase this bottle back, sadly empty, um, but it's, a, it's a, a dumpy square bottle with a wonderful label, a green glass, wonderful label on it, Henneke's written down the side and tomato nine year old. And again, I can oh. send some photos of that over. And then from then, we've got bottles from the 1940s, the 50s, the 60s, 70s, 80s and so on. Um, and it's been incredible to track. One of the ways that we know um, how, how it's developed is on the label, there was a, a drawing of the distillery and you can put the bottles beside each other and you can see bits of the distillery being added and taken away <laughs> over the decades. So the, the sketch, wow. the sketch yeah. changes from decade to decade. Oh, that's and great. Going back to the records of what did the distillery look like and when, we're able to say, okay, so that kind of fits with that time period. Yeah, great. Great that branding could do that. Um, yeah. So I... I, I also think about when I'm when I was there and I was doing a tour around the uh, distillery I was looking at the barrels and I noticed I think the oldest barrel I saw was 1967 yeah. that that was there and there were colors on the sides of the barrels did did the colors on the barrels have any significance or uh, was that just uh, because some of them are black some of them are gray some of them are red yeah so the the, the colors are um, it's how the the guys on site, it's how the, the distillers used to know how many times the cask had been filled. 
Now, I don't, I can't remember the system myself, but it was a case of, you know, one colour meant that this was a first fill cask, another colour meant that this was a second fill, another okay. colour meant third fill and refill. So it was just a case of um, that told you how many times the cask could be used. This was long before we had incredible uh, systems online where at the press of a button, you've got all that information on a spreadsheet. Yeah, yeah. Well, when you get to a barrel as old as 1967, uh, does there become a worry about making sure that that whiskey doesn't drop below whiskey levels? In other words, 40% ABV? Yeah, so we have to re-gauge these casks quite regularly. Um, so we will we'll, we'll go and take a strength reading of the cask. And that, the, the other thing as well is the, the, the volume losses. You know, These casks from the 1960s will have less than half of the original contents in them because of the evaporation. Now, that's, uh, we're still in a much more fortunate position in that regards than the distillers in Kentucky, for example. Uh, we only lose about 1.5% a year here. Mm -hmm. But yeah, we, we, unlike Kentucky, where the strength will increase, uh, our, our ABV is going to decrease because we have this incredibly humid but cold climate. Um, so it's, it's alcohol that's taken into the atmosphere rather than, than the water. Um, so yeah, we have to be wary that these casks will eventually drop below 40%. And we know that we need to remove the liquid from the cask before that happens. If they drop below 40%, what, what can you do with them? So the, the cask in and of itself at that point, I'm just actually looking at the stock sheet here just to find out where we're at. So the 1967s um, are around about 44% ABV right now. So they've, they've got a little ways to go. Um, <laughs> the, the, the first thing... The, the, the favourable option is get the liquid out of the cask before that, that happens. Um, one thing that you can do, though, is, and, and we can't do it with a 1967 because we only have two of these casks, you know, and then it's a jump to 1971. But if, if we say, for example, we have a year where we've got 10 casks and one of them drops below 40%, we could add that in with the other nine and that would bring the strength of the overall whiskey up to above 40%. So one of the casks will be below, but overall the strength is above 40%, so it's still uh, whiskey. So that's one thing you could do. Um, but when it gets to this sort of age, you're really looking at bottling these as single casks in their own right. It's very rare that you're going to see a mass vatting of 55-year-old single malt. Yeah, that's uh, that would be, uh, I mean, is this kind of where your limited edition program comes from? And it, when you look at a barrel like that 1967, do you kind of have a target for where you're trying to get it to and hoping you can get it over the over the hump? Yeah, I think so. I think we've, we've always, so we've got a, quite a tight five-year plan in terms of releases and then a, a looser 10-year plan, uh, which is kind of going, you know, if, if all of these things work out, okay, we'll be able to achieve this, you know. Um, and, and so, you know, we're, the, the first thing is, how does it taste? You know, there's there's no point releasing it if it's not good, um, and it, it it might often get to the point where you go, this is in its prime right now. We need to bottle this right now. This is never going to get better. Um, but with something like a 1967, which is currently 55 years old, you probably are thinking it would be good if that made it to 60. You know, that's a nice round number. Um, so yeah. things like that. So we we we've had a couple of 50 year old releases over the last few years there, and that's a great thing to do. Um, the 1967, I would like to see at least one of them get to 60 years old. Um, yeah. But it might just be the case that actually this is good to go now. There's a demand for this now. So um, we've got to be flexible. Um, f flexible but with a plan is probably the best way to sum up probably the, the whiskey market as a whole, really. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, 67. Um... I, what's interesting is I've heard this and I've, I've never actually confirmed it with anybody. Um, but it's my understanding that if the whiskey is really uh, probably perfect, but you're trying to get it to that age, you could actually recask it into a tired cask. Now you're already into a tired cask. Already in a tired cask, so, yeah. yeah. So you don't really have that advantage. But is that a strategy that, that distillers will use? Yeah, I mean, so... Quite often what we'll do is the other way around. So particularly when we look at younger whiskies, for example, most of what we produce here at Tomatin in the first instance, a lot of it will be filled into first fill bourbon barrels, a lot of it into sherry casks, but a good amount will be filled into refill casks. 
couple of reasons. The first one is that will then allow us in 40 years still to have these incredible tired old cask refill uh, tropical flavours that we get in our older expressions. But also take our, again, I go back to one of my favourites, the 14 year old. It's matured for the first 11 years in refill casks and then the final three years in those tawny port casks. Mm. If we fully matured it for 14 years in tawny port casks, go and buy yourself a bottle of port <laughs> because you're getting no <laughs> distillery character. Yeah. Whereas those first 11 years in the refill cast, that still gives you all of those incredible, vibrant, bright tomato flavours. It allows for some of the, the harsher notes that you get from a new mixed spirit to evaporate and, and to mellow out. But you get to this point at 11 years old where you've got this wonderful expression of tomato and spirit that's ready to take on the flavours of this finishing cask. So we'll fill... Um, We'll quite often fill refill casks and then re-rack it into a finishing cask so that we get what we're looking for all along, that balance of distillery and maturation character. It's not about, you quite often hear people talking about finishing as taking bad spirit and making it better. That's not what we're trying to do here. We're looking for balance. Um, so, so we'll do that quite a lot. I have in some instances, so there was a parcel, I think it was from 1993, if I remember correctly, I sampled these three casks and they were in second fill sherry casks for that full time, so for 27 years now. And they were remarkable, but we had no plans to release them or do anything with them. Um, and that was an example where we said, right, let's get these into refill casks. Uh, to, 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 you know, refill uh, American oak casks. Second yeah. fill sherry had done enough. Um, but they were at the risk of being, for lack of a better word, overcooked. You know, mm. so it's it's a little bit like when you, when you've got something in the oven, but you're not quite ready to eat it, so you just turn the oven down just to keep it warm. That's almost what we're doing when we move something from an active cask into a refill cask. You're you're preserving the characteristics, and in some ways, you're going to allow for a little bit of that oxidation to take place, which is going to give you a different look altogether. Yeah, when I think about blending, because I've I've toyed with some blending myself and sometimes the experiments are amazing and sometimes the flavors clash yeah. so when you're talking about barreling whiskeys are there certain barrels that you've run across styles of barrels where they just don't match the flavor of your new make spirit it's so one of the and, and this goes back to the history of tomato so you've got you've got to think that the style of spirit that we produce was really developed from the, 19, the late 1960s onwards. So this is where Kubokin and Tomatin have a bit of a crossover. So up until the 1960s, all of the whiskey made in the Highlands and made in Speyside was lightly peated. One of my pet peeves, and I'm sure you've run across it yourself, is when you go on a tour of a distillery and someone says, we've been making our whiskey the same way for 200 years. <laughs> it's absolute nonsense because... Yeah. The technology's changed, the barley variety's changed, the yeast variety's changed, so much has changed. Um, in the Highlands, it was lightly peated up until the 1960s. And then you start to get uh, the discovery of North Sea oil and gas, you get uh, the development of the, the road network into the Highlands, and you get the, the development of third party maltings. Um, and that also coincides with the massive demand for malt whiskey. So a lot of these distilleries are no longer able to fulfill all their own maltings on site. Um, the blenders don't want peated whiskey. They want a, a, a softer, fruitier style. So that all happens at the same time. And that's when the style of tomato that we know today starts to be developed. That light, fruity, delicate style of spirit. Kubokin, uh, which we've been making for one week a year since 2005 is a lightly peated spirit. So it's taking that kind of more historical style of Highland spirit, but then adding in a more modern approach to maturation. So you're getting the best of both worlds in many ways. Whereas Tomatin, that fruity spirit starts to develop in the 1960s and 70s with the goal of being sold to as many blenders in Scotland as possible. It had to be an incredibly versatile spirit mm. because these blenders aren't all producing the same characteristic. They had tomato as their backbone when it came to malt, but some of them will make something heavy, some of them will make something light, some of it will be smoky, some of it will be fruity. So tomato's always had, since that period of time, a really versatile spirit. We fast forward to today and we take that 
and we've still got our own uh, cooperage on site. We still work directly with wineries and spirits producers around the world, as well as some of the biggest cooperages in the world. And it's very rare that we come across something that just totally doesn't work with the yeah. spirit. Um, I've had some examples of where we've used white wine casks, and they've not more personal preference than anything. Yeah, I would say tomato works really well in ex spirit casks, so bourbon casks, rum casks, cognac casks. It works really, really well because the distillery character is allowed to flourish with those. Um, it works really well in fortified wine casks, so sherry, port, Madeira, these things. It also works well in some nice red wine casks. Um, it's worked well in beer casks. There's there's very few things that I've come across and went, oh, that, we're going to struggle with that. Yeah. Um, but you know, that, that's why we continue to experiment. That's why we continue to look for new casks and, and try different things. Um, sometimes they work, sometimes they really, really work. You know, and that's it's almost that thing. It's it's not that anything's gone wrong. It's that just this is a lot better. Yeah. So one of the things that I've noticed is a trend, especially here in the United States, I sense that this is a fairly new trend in Scotland, is the release of barrel-proof cast-strength whiskey. When did you guys first start uh, releasing a, a cast-strength? So in, in the, all of the time that I've been here, we've had a private cask program, which is where um, our master distiller, and now our master distiller and myself, will select about 50 casks each year from the 170,000 on site will select 50 casks that we believe are in and of themselves incredible expressions that are worthy of being bottled as a single cask and they will always be bottled at cask strength um, but we released a cask strength expression in our core range in 2015 and very much what was happening was I was travelling to a lot of festivals across Europe at the time and it was just, I believe it was just before we launched the 14-year-old and I happened to have a sample of the 14-year-old at cask strength mm -hmm. and I was showing it to people at the show saying, you know, this is going to be coming out next year, it'll be at 46% but this is the style of thing and the number of people that we had saying, your spirit at cask strength is so drinkable, you really need to do this. So we brought that back to the table and within about six months we developed the tomato and cask strength. So that was back in 2015 and it's been part of the core range ever since. Um, I know there's, we definitely weren't the first to do it. You've got things like Aberlour, Abuna and Glenfarclas 105 which have been around for a long, long time now. Um, but yeah, you're right, there's most, a, a great number of distilleries now will have, if not a cask strength, they, they will have something of a higher proof within their yeah. range. Um, and it's, it very much is to satisfy the people like ourselves, you know, the kind of the, the, the people that want to try the expression of the distillery in its purest character. It's definitely not how mass market whiskey is sold. You know, you're, 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 you're kind of going into a supermarket and buying a bottle of whiskey is not going to opt for that. But it's, that's what our range exists for. Within our core range, you're going to have things like Tomat and Dualcus, which is a massive crowd pleaser, 99 points at the IWSC for $40, an incredible, um, an incredible single malt. But then within the core range, you've also got things like the cask strength or the 14-year-old, which has more of a cask uh, focus on it and things like that. So it's all about, for us, making sure that we have something for everyone. Yeah. Well, I'm going to go in and do a tasting on your 12-year-old uh, your right now, which is your flagship. When you talk about a flagship or when you try to pick out something and peg it as a flagship whiskey, what should it what should it say about your distillery? That, that's a great question. So, I mean, one of the reasons the twelve year olds a flagship is that within our core range, it's been there the longest. Um, this whiskey we first started releasing the twelve year old in the late nineteen nineties for the American market, and then in two thousand and three it replaced the ten year old in our core range. So, this product's been in our core range for twenty years now. That alone makes it the flagship. But yeah. for me, what this is. I, I don't subscribe to the notion of the, the five Scotch whisky regions in the sense that the, the way that it's told is that each region has its own flavour profile. Um, you know, so Isla, Smoky, Campbellton, Heavy, Laxy, Lowe's. Right. Uh, sometimes, yes, great. But then what happens if you're drinking a, a Brook Laddie, which has no smoke in it at all? That's just... So 
And I think the Highlands is the greatest example of that where you've got a region that's always been, this goes back to the very beginning of the conversation, it's always been very difficult to generalise. But what I think about the Tomatin 12-year-old is if you want to give someone a glass of whiskey that doesn't only tell you this is what a Tomatin is, it says this is what a Highland single malt is. Mm -hmm. The Tomatin 12-year-old is the one because from that very central location in the Highlands, the 12-year-old takes influence from all around. It takes some of those bigger, bolder flavours from the northern distilleries, like say the Dalmores and the, the old Pulteneys of the world. It takes some of the fruitier aspects of those eastern Highland malts, it takes some of the lighter, more floral aspects of the lowland Highlands, and it's got that earthy style from the western Highlands, all married into one single malt. The, for me, your flagship malt should be the most balanced expression of your range it should be the dna of of your range so it um it's interesting when i nose it because i pick up a lot of the the apple and um you know the the baking spice and then that bit of vanilla and toffee coming in from from the bourbon barrel as well i almost get a little um fresh wood scent out of there yeah which is interesting. Um, and you said earthy and I'm going, I'm wondering if I'm picking up earthy and I'm just mixing earthy with uh, kind of a smoky character, kind of an earthy smoky character that I get. It's not, it's not a peated yeah. note, but it just, there, there's something about it. Like there's this really deep in hidden uh, smoke note that I get out of it. Yeah. I mean, for me, what I quite often think with the 12 year old is it, it, for me, the earthy thing is almost like a forest. It's that kind of forest floor, that, that pine needle-y type of thing going on that I often get there. And yeah. yeah, sometimes I do get a hint of smoke, but not smoke. If you know, it's, 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 a, it's a different thing. And I think because it's a flavour that you very often associate with smoky whiskies that you maybe think smoke there. Right, um, but it's 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 just a different kind of edge to it altogether. I think that's what I kind of pick up. I mean, that, uh, talk about you and uh, Bunahaben and how you both do one run of peated whiskey per yeah. year, and you think how hard it is to clean out those stills and make sure that there's no smoke left behind in the in the stills. You wonder, you know, is 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 am I catching a hint of that maybe uh, right. in there? But yeah, it's really interesting because, like I say, it's it, you have to look for it. But when you do, um, I, I, I do sense that it's there. Um, it also has a, uh, a really nice, you know, it's not overly milky kind of a, a body to it, but it has a really nice body yeah. to the whiskey, which I think is one of the least paid attention to aspects of, of a whiskey that I think is one of the best qualities of a whiskey is if it has a really nice mouthfeel to it, it makes the drinking experience so nice. So a, a funny story there. So in March of last year, was it last year? Yeah, March of last year, the word blender was added to my job title. So I became blender and global brand ambassador. Absolutely delighted. And my business cards arrived. And about two days later, I caught COVID. Um, and I had almost no symptoms. But the one symptom that I did have was I totally lost my sense of smell and taste. <sighs> And at the time, I was like, oh, God, these I've got a lot of business cards here that say a blender on it. You know? uh, luckily, it came back. Um, but for about 10 days, um, I couldn't smell or taste anything. But I tried a lot. of This is very geeky, and I'm well aware of it. But I tried <laughs> quite a few different whiskies in that time and really developed an incredible kind of appreciation of mouthfeel and body because it was the only sense that I was getting. I wasn't smelling mm. anything. I wasn't tasting anything, but I could feel it. I could see what it was doing in my mouth. And it, it, it gave me a, a, a much greater appreciation for that aspect of, of, of whiskey drinking. Now, something like the 12 year old ultimately is designed as a real crowd pleaser. You know, we bottle this at 43%. It's our biggest selling whiskey worldwide. So, this is not the one that I particularly would spend a huge amount of time in a Glen Cairn glass writing and dissecting. Yeah. But it's got that if you want to do it. You know, you can enjoy this just as a dram while you're watching, watching the football at night, you know, watching a movie. Or you can really get into it and start to pick apart, you know, 
what are the bourbon casks doing? What are the sherry casks doing? Mm -hmm. Wow, that refill cask has really brought in this apple and pear. That distillery character is still there. So it, it allows the drinker to do many things there. Yeah. You said pear, and immediately on the finish, I'm going, oh, yeah. I'll get yeah, that pear. it's right there. <laughs> and that's the, that's the difficult thing. I always try when I'm doing a tasting not to give away tasting notes just because it's so suggestive. But I always it see is, my role yeah. being not to tell you what you should be tasting, but but why we use those casks, what flavors we're looking for when we use those casks. And then it's up to you how the overall kind of marriage of those things has come together. It's it's funny you hear how we all got through COVID because I lost my sense of taste and smell too. And I lost it for a good probably five months. Oh, wow. And, and during that time period, I mean, you, you actually feel a bit depressed. I mean, yeah. especially when you are once I had just gotten in and I'm like, I'm finally tasting all of this stuff. I'm finally nosing all this stuff. And then it's taken away from me. It was, uh, it was a frustrating thing, but I found some ways to cope. And one of the ways I coped was I found a whiskey that was one that was an older whiskey that I didn't, it was a rye, but it didn't taste like a rye because it spent too much time in the barrel. But, um, for some reason, parts of my sense of taste were coming back just one or two flavors would come back no oak i couldn't taste oak at all but i could taste everything else so i started drinking all the whiskeys that i thought were over oaky and they all came up with these really nice personalities that i was like oh this is an interesting way to to get through it but um it was uh, actually a jack daniels that pulled me out because as i was nosing it one day i was like "Ooh, i smell banana and that's right. the that's a a key scent in that whiskey. So it's like when it, it's it's interesting to see how you have to come back from something like that, and how much more I appreciate whiskey now after having gone through all of that stuff, um, because now I, I I understand how valuable that sense of taste and smell really is to the whole experience. Yeah, no, it's it's incredible. It's it it. it totally changed my perception of 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 what mouthfeel is for me and yeah. and and there were so, and i i only lost my uh, sense of smell for about 10 days but you're right there was a point in that where you're thinking you know there's no there's no guideline as to when i'm getting this back right <laughs> so was, yeah and yeah. i think that's what was the, the depressing thing about it was not necessarily not having uh, smell or taste but yeah not knowing when it was coming back that was well and it makes it makes everything lifeless so that's yeah. kind of that that's that's the hard part about it yeah um so uh one last thing really to talk about is uh kubakan because it's uh it's it's a, what's funny is if i said where whiskey lore stories started it started with me sitting in a, a bar uh, in um, a tavern called the Mash Tun in Abelauer, yep. and uh, him putting together a flight of whiskeys for me. And I said, I like smoky whiskeys, but I want some Highland smoky whiskeys. And he put in, and I think it was the 2005 expression of Kubakan that he had up on the shelf, and he poured it for me. And I was reading the back of the bottle, and I went, Oh man, this is a really interesting story. I wonder how much of this is true. Yeah. And, uh, and that's that was one of my first challenges was to try to learn about that that whiskey, the story of the ghost, ghost dog. I drove out to the uh, Dalarada Church, yep. uh, where the Witch of Logan was uh, supposed to have uh, chased uh, or been chased by the dogs out to, and all of that sort of stuff. So it was a lot of fun going through all of that. Uh, and when I visited the distillery, I had an opportunity to taste them. I see it on the shelf. A uh, similar box as the one that I have now in the U.S. Uh, occasionally, I will see an old bottle there, but I don't see any new bottles. Is that something that is just going to, I mean, because it's a smaller supply, something that's just going to be a uh, uh, Scotland only or European only kind of thing? Yeah. So what happened there? So it's really interesting, actually. So the spirit itself, the whiskey itself is lightly peated and it's got this incredible, again, balance of that distillery character and uh, maturation character and I think that's a it's something to to touch on is the fact that historically peated whiskey was not heavily peated it, it was peated by necessity it was the only fuel source we had to dry barley it wasn't peated in the way that a lot of whiskies are today which is for this incredibly smoky flavor 
And even when you try things like, I'll, I'll not name names, but there's some incredible, uh, well-known, heavily peated whiskies today that if you try the same expression from the 1960s and 70s, it's actually quite fruity. It's mm. a little bit earthy. And it was because peat was by necessity um, not, not flavour-driven. Yeah. Um, and I think that's what we've, we've created with Kubokan. But if you look at the box that's over your shoulder there, the black box with a big blue puff of smoke, you would be mistaken for thinking this might be the he most heavily peated whiskey in the world, you know. So one of the things that we recognised was the packaging and the way we were communicating was at odds with the liquid that people were getting. So you would have people saying, you know, uh, I, I bought this because I thought it would be a heavily peated whiskey and it, it, it wasn't, it was lightly peated. And you would have people that wouldn't buy it because they were worried it was going to be heavily peated. <laughs> but they would have probably enjoyed it. Yeah. So in 2019, we rebranded it and it's got a totally different package and look and feel now. But at that time, we also made the decision to move away from the mythical story, um, which was, again, that came out of the, the research that I did back in 2012. So part of my research, my original job at the distillery was to research the history of the distillery. I came from a background of studying Scottish history. And as much as I wanted to find the true story of the distillery, I also recognised pretty early on that the people are an incredibly important part of the Tomato story. Today, we're the last distillery in Scotland that still provides housing to the majority of the, the workforce. So over half of the people that make and produce the whiskey in the distillery behind me live in the 30 cottages here. Mm. So as much as I was driven by finding the facts and the detail, I also had that in the back of my head, a hugely important part of this region is the folklore and is the stories that go along with that. And that's where the story of the, the Witch of Lagan and, of course, The Last Wolf in Scotland all came out. And the, the designers then took that and developed Kubok and Ghost Dog. By 2019, we, we started to really realise that what people are looking for, you know, that, that kind of story of the, the romantic, the myth, the, the, the legend, the lore um, yeah. that sold whisky for the last hundred years... People were moving away from that. People now are far more interested in the truth and they're far more interested in understanding why what they are tasting tastes the way it does and how it's been made. So Kubokin now is far more focused, certainly from a storytelling point of view and a packaging point of view, is far more focused on the, the, the nitty-gritty of the distillation. So the fact that it is lightly peated Scottish barley the fact that it's only made for one week a year and that, that that's the last week of production before the distillery closes at Christmas time. Uh, the fact that we use unusual casks, all of, those, all of those things, that's what the story relies on. Now, now of course, if people say, what does Kubokan mean? We will always say Kubokan's Gaelic for ghost dog and um, this is why that's the story. But let me tell you how we make it. That's yeah. the, the, the way we go through now. It's so still, in terms of... It, uh, I was going to say, it still says it in a little, uh, little yeah. script down at the bottom of the boxes. Yeah. yeah, so we launched the new packaging at the end of 2019 um, with a plan for a global rollout that was interrupted by COVID. Um, so that's kind of put the launch plan back a couple of years, but you should over the next couple of years see more and more of Kubokin and the new packaging rolled out into the States uh, and into Canada as well. Um, Kubokin's signature, which is the core expression, is the same recipe as the Kubokin that you have behind you there. So if okay. you've tried that Kubokin before yeah. and really enjoyed it, that recipe is the, still the core recipe. The first three casks that we filled all the way back in 2005, bourbon, sherry, Oloroso, uh, sorry, bourbon, virgin oak, and Oloroso sherry, they're still the core component of Signature. But around that, we have the Creations, which is where we use casks that nobody's using. We have a 12-year-old matured in Caribbean rum casks, and we have a 15-year-old annual release, which is fully matured in Oloroso sherry casks. Very nice. Yeah, I got uh, three samples that I left there with, and I enjoyed all three of them. So Excellent. Uh, yeah, and they're in much more pastel-colored yeah. packaging yeah. now rather than the, the black, which I get absolutely. that. Yeah, I absolutely. That. Just kind of telling that story that this is not the, the, the big brutish, heavily peated whiskey that you, yeah. you once thought it was. This is a far more delicate, <laughs> expressive... Well, if anybody, if anybody wants the Kubakan story, they can go listen to uh, Season 1, Episode right. 5. I tell the whole story, Witch of Logan and everything else in there. So uh, 
that that was uh, that was a lot of fun. I will say this about lore uh, is that what I do like about it is that I wouldn't have been as investigative uh, of your uh, territory there had it not been for that story because I wanted right. to go see the old church. I wanted to kind of get a sense of that story. So that is kind of the fun side of of it. But I do understand whiskey fans are becoming much more about the whiskey rather than the marketing which is uh, which is music to my ears in other ways so 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 to bring it full circle as well the the church at Dalarossi that you went to see for the witch of lagan story is also where john mcdougall is buried is it yeah yeah so uh, and you can actually see there it's because his son um died during the war and was buried in the same place his grave uh, can be found online and you can see the inscription of that at Dalarossi churchyard. So you, you would have been wow. right there. Yeah. Yeah. Man, I was being yeah. chased by sheep. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah. sheep and midges. Yeah. Yes. Yes, absolutely. So, well, Scott, thank you so much for taking the time today and going through the history of Tomatin and, uh, and for the tastings, I have some whiskeys coming to me that I'll be featuring on the YouTube channel here at some point. Uh, Excellent. Sh- so, yeah, I really appreciate that. And, uh, again, love to talk with people who are into history and especially someone who has the advantage that you, you have of being able to dig back in the archives when you can and actually see some of that, that rich history. So thank you so much for, for being a part of the show. Thanks for having me, Drew. Cheers. Cheers. <laughs>